Welcome back to Genetics in the Party with Emily. I'm your host, Emily Johnston, and I'll be taking you along on my journey to learn about all things genetics in extensive livestock. Last season, we explored the foundational aspects of genetics. We discussed everything from basic genetic principles to practical applications on farm. This season, we're kicking it up a notch. Today's guest is Katrina Millen, an extension and technical consultant from the Agricultural Business Research Institute, also known as ABRI. And we're here to discuss all things breed plan. Some of the topics we're going to discuss include the importance of understanding your production system, tips and tricks for using genetic technologies, and a whole lot more. This is an episode I can guarantee you'll want to stick around for, and one you'll enjoy. So with that, let's get into it. Welcome back to another episode of Genetics in the Paddock with Emily. Today I'm joined by Katrina Millen from the Agricultural Business Research Institute, also known as ABRI. So thanks so much, Katrina, for joining me today. I'm really looking forward to having you on the show. Thanks, Emily. Thanks. So I'm going to let you do the intro for what you actually do at ABRI because as we just discussed, it is a little bit too long for me to explain, so I'll let you do the honours. Yeah, so I am a member of the ABRI Extension Services team here at ABRI, and so what what that entails is uh, we are the extension team for breed plan, and so where our role is to support the use and understanding of, of breed plan and the related genetic technologies that ABRI offers. Wonderful, and breed plan is just beef cattle, right? Yeah, so breed plan's a genetic evaluation service for for beef cattle. Wonderful. Thank you for that intro. That is much more succinct than I could ever do. So I guess let's just jump into a bit about you as a bit of a start for this episode. So can you just tell me just a little bit about your background? I'm interested to know if we go back a little bit further. So did you grow up surrounded by agriculture? Yeah, what's what's your background? What's the background for Katrina look like? Yeah, so I didn't grow up surrounded by agriculture. I actually grew up in, in Melbourne. I guess if we go back a couple of generations, my grandfather was off a, a, a sheep property but moved to Melbourne after World War II. So we certainly had links to ag in that I, I remember being quite little and going up to uh, northeast Victoria and visiting uh, family who, who had cattle and going out to feed the cows and that sort of thing. But certainly not day to day, not directly, very much grew up in the city with, yeah, minimal, minimal links to, to ag, but always really liked animals, was always very keen on animals and really enjoyed genetics. When I went to, to uni, I uh, did a Bachelor of Science at Monash Uni, which was a, a great introduction to genetics and then was keen to go on and do some further study except at the time Monash Uni was doing a lot of work on model organisms so things like zebrafish and drosophila the the fruit fly and that didn't sound very interesting to me so that was when I said no I want to do something with with animals but also ag and feel like you know it's something that's going to give back to to the community and and be I, I can see the benefits so jumped across to Melbourne Uni and did did a Bachelor of Ag Science Honours with with Mike Goddard and he said to me look you can work on dairy beef or or sheep but dairy had the the better data set so I did Ag Science Honours with the dairy genetic evaluation so was technically at Melbourne Uni but actually based at Vic DPI as they were at the time yeah and that's sort of how I fell into working in ag. Lovely that sounds like a great introduction and I feel like working in dairy must be so interesting and now working in the beef space so how did you do the transition from dairy to beef was it a fairly smooth one did you feel like connected to the dairy industry or were you happy to apply just the general genetics knowledge and love for animals into any sort of species like how did we get to where you are today working in breed plan yeah so um, I spent a little bit of time as I said with Vic DPI and when I was studying I really enjoyed doing lab work so actually being in the lab doing DNA extractions sequencing all that sort of thing but I guess at that time 
DNA sequencing was really expanding and it was moving to the point that you spent very little time in the lab and then a lot of time doing computational biology at the computer screen. I love lab work. I'm not a computational biologist. And so I was quite interested in extension, uh, Dairy Futures CRC at the time. I had a mentor who was involved in dairy extension. And I guess initially I would have been more than happy to do dairy extension, but really extension roles are quite hard to find and hard to come by so I applied for for the one up here in Armidale in New South Wales with with Breedplan and was lucky enough to get the the position and so moved to Armidale and started learning about beef cattle. Lovely and it's and how was the move from Melbourne to Armidale? Yeah I remember when they interviewed me that they told me that Armidale was freezing cold and (laughs) it might be a bit of an adjustment but we've got family in northeast Victoria and I was used to to cold cold areas up there so no it 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 was fine it's a little bit different climate wise in terms of the summer versus winter rainfall that that was what took the longest to get used to but no it's I, I really enjoy when I was in Melbourne it took forever to get to work you always had traffic I love being in Armidale being slightly out of town now with where I live and It doesn't take me long to get to work and it's a a nice place to live. That's nice. I feel like every time I come to Armidale myself, it's just a breath of fresh air. It's so beautiful out here. I mean, I live on the coast, but no, it's so nice to just come out and have a look at you guys are situated in such a lovely spot out here. So I guess drawing back to your extension role within ABRI, what does a typical day in the life look like for you? Yeah, it's a, a great question. And I guess what I really love about working in extension for for breed plan is that it's really varied i don't so i've i've been here nearly 10 years it'll be 10 years in january and i feel like i don't do the same thing every day and that's important for me because it keeps what i do fresh so really really varied depending on what we're what we're up to i do spend quite a bit of time in the office we do uh, breed plan ebv queries working one-on-one with producers, answering questions, phone and email support, that sort of thing, but also running our extension initiatives. So for example, earlier today, we ran one of our Getting Started with Breed Plan workshops, which is our online workshop that we're, we've introduced for the first time this year. So we do webinars, workshops, in-person workshops. We're hoping to get around Australia and New Zealand in 2025 to deliver some in-person workshops. So quite a bit of time again traveling doing doing workshops with producers on the ground also involved in maintaining our Facebook page and de- developing our newsletter that gets sent around every couple of months so yeah a lot of varied activities and not a not a typical day-to-day experience it's nice to have a bit of variety in your job as you said it just keeps it fresh and exciting and it sounds like you have such an important role within ABRI working in extension, just being able to deliver important information to people, new updates and just help them with queries because I'm sure this is quite a new space for a lot of people and even the people that have been in for a while, like you, questions pop up and it's good just to have somebody that you can ask those to and get like a good a good response. I think it makes the process of using any sort of science or application so much easier. So with Breed Plan, do you guys also work internationally? Is it Australia based? Is it statewide? Can you give me a bit more of a rundown about the clients that you provide the services for? Yeah. So when I first started, we had funding from Meat and Livestock Australia and a number of breed societies to have the Southern Beef Technology Services and Tropical Beef Technology Services, SBTS and TBTS. Some of your listeners might be familiar with those acronyms. They were Australian based. So because we had the MLA funding, we were targeting Australian producers and we we work across all states within within Australia. That funding finished up two to three years ago now. And so one of the nice things for me in my role in terms of keeping things fresh, as we were just discussing, is that that's meant that I've been able to to do some work with some of our international breed plan clients. So we've got clients in New Zealand, Southern Africa, South America, North America, UK and Europe. And so, yeah, I've, I've been really lucky in the last few years to be able to do some, some work with producers and breed society clients across those, those different areas. 
That would be really interesting to get to see how different countries operate and how the different production systems work. So how do you navigate the differences in markets between these countries, like, for example, with the UK and Africa, when engaging with your international clients? Yeah, and I guess that's something that, that keeps it fresh. It's It's been a learning curve. I'm obviously quite familiar with Australian-based production systems, having worked the majority of my time at ABRI in that space. But yeah, certainly been interesting to talk to our, our UK and African clients. So for example, with the UK, we have often producers with smaller herd sizes than we see here in Australia. So making sure we're aware of things like that when we're delivering our extension material and discussing uh, issues with with those clients. And in Africa, I was lucky enough to go to Africa in 2022. And so just before I went, making sure that I had a good feel for, for what the production system was. One thing that I found really interesting that I would never have thought of when I was when I was over there is uh, there was a at the conference there was a discussion about how you manage water sources to protect them from elephants and I just remember thinking I would never have thought of that being a problem at all so yeah it's it's a matter of understanding what we're offering them in the analysis what their production systems look like and we're we're really lucky in southern Africa to have uh, the livestock registering federation LRF who do breed plan extension across southern Africa so they were a good sounding board for the sorts of issues and things to be aware of when when talking to southern African clients. And are there any other specific challenges or opportunities that you feel like might arise or do arise when dealing with these sort of diverse global markets? Yeah I I guess it it comes back for me to just making sure that you're aware of what the production systems look like, what the end target markets look like. So it's a challenge but it's also an opportunity. Africa once again Southern Africa is a a good example. When we're in South Africa they don't have anything like our MSA system so being aware that it it was a commodity-based market rather than a a system with emphasis on meat quality. That's certainly something they're looking to change. But at the time, you know, in Australia, I might talk about how we can breed for Meat Standards Australia to meet meat specs and improve carcass quality. It's something that you will mention to a Southern African audience, but it's not a big part of their day-to-day consideration. So it's, yeah, meeting, meeting those differences and being aware of the endpoint and the production system so that you can target your extension messages for them. Interesting. Yeah, that, that's a lot of things to consider, especially when you are trying to give a, an extension message that is applicable to a lot of different people as well. But you, you, we did speak just a little bit then about understanding the production systems of your clients. So why is this something that's important for you guys to understand before giving these sort of genetic recommendations or extension messages yeah so I was really fortunate when I first started with ABRI obviously not having a beef background I had a number of our clients who were fantastic in explaining how they did things on the ground what what traits were of important and so for me understanding the production system is really important in terms of our our extension messaging because even within Australia, we see a diversity of, of target endpoints of different production systems. So, for example, northern Australia with the, the tropical Bosindicus type cattle are more extensive rangeland type, type systems with not necessarily as much inputs as you would see in a more, in a, in a southern production system that might have fewer animals on smaller smaller properties, more intensively managed. And then if we go across to WA, what's been really interesting over there is hearing more about their Vila production system where they might be turning cattle off at nine to 10 months. So that's important because if I'm talking about, well, which traits are important to your production system, I need to understand the production system. So for example, in WA, if you're turning cattle off for slaughter at nine, 10 months old, We can talk about how intramuscular fat, so the marbling in the the animal is important, but it's not as it's not important in a in a production system where they're they're turned off or they're still growing. Whereas over in southern Australia, Victoria, southern New South Wales, where they are targeting MSA markets with 
with older supermarket turn off at 18, 20, 20 months of age, for example, that trait suddenly becomes a lot more important. So I need to know what the production system is and those sorts of considerations to tailor the extension advice. Obviously, the person that understands the production system best is the producer that's living and working in that production system. But as an extension officer, I think it's really important that I tailor my extension advice to to our clients depending on their circumstances so that they can make the best use of, of Brink Plan and the genetic evaluation service that we offer. That's a great explanation and I think it's just so important what you just said to be able to tailor that information so they're actually making genetic improvement in the right direction rather than you know potentially going backwards or focusing in another area and just helping people get towards their target markets and what they're actually trying to achieve in their production system. So that's that's a great point there, Katrina. I'm also interested in how, so in, in, your, in your own words, how do maternal traits contribute to the efficiency of production systems, particularly in those challenging environments, maybe like South Africa? Yeah, so I guess production system efficiency, when I think about it, I really think about it in, in two parts. I think it's easy to identify that we have animals that are turned off for, for slaughter and obviously things like growth and finishing ability are going to be important in those steer progeny and heifer if it's a, a fully terminal system. But the other side of that equation is the, the maternal cow herd. And so for me, when we're looking at efficiency in in maternal, in, in the cow herd, what we're really looking for firstly is a cow that can get pregnant. So she's got to get in calf, which is our fertility traits, like days to calving. She's got to have got to give birth to that calf and preferably calve without assistance so that's things like our calving ease ebvs become important in that situation we want that calf to be born alive so we don't just want the calf to be born without assistance we'd like it to be alive it then needs to hit the ground and grow so yes there is the growth potential of that individual animal which it's getting from mum and dad but there's also the maternal contribution that that cow makes to the growth of her calf through her milk and her her ability to feed that calf. So that's where our milk EBV comes in. And then really we want her to do all of that, get pregnant, calve unassisted, grow the calf to weaning without costing too much to feed. So that's where things like mature cow weight and the the size of the the maternal cow herd becomes important. And that's going to depend on your production system again. But there are EBVs that can help with all of that that part of the cycle. And then really she's got to go back and do that year after year. So yeah, there's there's certainly, when you think about production system efficiency, it's not just a single trait. It's really how does everything fit together to make those animals the most efficient that they can be. And basically you just don't want, want cattle there that are not contributing. So we don't want empty cows you know, we, we want to improve them genetically so that we can get the most efficient production system we can. Amazing. Thank you so much for answering that. And it sounds like you guys have a whole lot of great EBVs that will help people make those decisions as well and choose just what they want to improve or pull back on or areas that they might need to change up a little bit. That's great that you guys have those available and able to help people understand those better depending on their production system and what's happening on the ground. I guess in this space as well, there is a lot of talk around sustainability and the introduction of health and welfare traits and all those sort of things. So I'm interested to hear your opinion on how these traits are becoming more important globally and what their impact on breeding decisions might look like or if people are starting to think about it already. Yeah, so I I think people are starting to think about it. I've certainly done a number of presentations for our, our clients worldwide talking about uh, sustainability, health and welfare traits. I think they're, it, it's exciting to see that sort of trait being worked on, certainly at the research level, because obviously, so Breed Plan started back in 1985 and at the time we had weight, weight EBVs only. And then over time new traits came in through the beef CRCs and other research that was being done with with fertility EBVs, carcass EBVs, temperament, etc. Those sorts of of traits 
have come on and we've got EBVs to help producers make more informed genetic selection decisions in those areas. And so I I do think what we're going to see happening is a, a shift towards sustainability traits, health traits, welfare traits, because that's really the suite of traits that we we don't don't have uh, as well developed yet. And so certainly within an Australian sense, if we think about tropical adaptation, for example, there are projects going on to collect things like buffalo fly lesion scores so that we can look and, and tick, tick resistance scores so that we can look at, you know, how can we identify and breed animals that are more able to cope with those challenges, particularly as we see things like buffalo fly heading heading further south out of Queensland down into northern New South Wales. So, yeah, to me, those traits are, are exciting. We see there's a, a large project happening at the moment to collect methane traits being led by the University of New England. And so hopefully out of that, we will see a methane EBV come out. But It's also answering in that project other questions about how do these traits relate to things like net feed intake, so feed efficiency, which I think is going to become important as we head into the future as well. So, yeah, to me, these traits are, yes, responding to that social licence to operate, you know, the the pressure we see from consumers who expect certain things in terms of, of welfare and sustainability, but they're also addressing, to me, the bigger picture is for the the producers themselves and talking about how can we have a efficient production system and yes as we just spoke about you can do that through the the traits that have already we already have so for example the the female uh, traits we just discussed but these are traits that will help help in that journey and I think to me that's what's driving it it's really how can we make production systems as efficient as as possible and that comes back to profitability because I I did a, a case study with a producer down in southwest Victoria and she said you know it's really easy to be green when you're in the black not so much when you're in the red so really it's about supporting producers to make make production systems as efficient and profitable as possible. Yeah, that's a really, really great answer. And I think that covered off on a lot of those sustainability and different health and welfare traits. And it's it's interesting to hear how many more traits are in the pipeline to help people make more sustainable breeding decisions and improve like the health and welfare and ability to cope with different stresses for their animals, which is always of value, I'm sure, for a lot of producers. So when we are talking about these traits, I just want to circle back a little bit, which a question I probably should have asked at the beginning, but what are some of the common challenges that seed stock producers face when collecting data for a breed plan, particularly regarding like management groups and unique cases like twins or orphans, which I'm sure are some of the questions that you probably get a lot of the time with your queries? Yeah, so there's a a range of challenges, but commonly we see, so seed stock producers are collecting the the trait data on farm. Most of that happens from when the animal is born through to it being around rising two-year-old. That's where most of the traits are are collected. There are some some exemptions, things like mature cow weight is obviously done on mature females. But yeah, it, it can be tricky. Breed plan works on the premise that only animals that have had equal opportunity to perform are directly compared. And that's because we know all of our production traits, things like growth, fertility, carcass attributes, they're not just influenced by the genetics, they're also influenced by the environment that that animal's raised in. And so what we do when we, when we calculate breed plan ABVs is aim to remove the environmental component of that performance so that we're just observing the genetic component. And that's that's the the premise there and so that's why we only compare animals that have had equal opportunity to perform head to head Mm -hmm. and so what's what's then really important for our seed stock producers is breed plan can't see what's happening in their paddocks so they they act as eyes for the breed plan analysis by telling us through their use of management groups yes it's it's okay to compare these animals head to head they've been raised in the same environment versus no that one was sick and its peers weren't or I've got two mobs this one was in paddock a this one was in paddock b and paddock a and b are are different nutritionally so 
we do rely on on seed stock producers to provide provide those management groups. Sometimes that's not a straightforward decision as to should I put this animal in a different management group to its peers. Um, it's particularly tricky with with things like twins, where if you think about twins, obviously we don't want to compare twins raised as twins to a single raised on mum, but not all twins are raised as twins in the paddock. And so you get in situations where you've got twins that were fostered or twins that were raised as, as singles. And so they're the sorts of things that we have management groups for, but it's it can be tricky. And so that's where we really encourage when we talk to our seed stock producers for if they're if they've got those sorts of tricky situations and they're not sure should I be putting animals into different management groups to reach out to the breed plan team. We are more than happy to answer those sort of queries. I answer those sorts of queries all the time and it's important that we do so because it's it's not always straightforward and it's something that in terms of the analysis it's important to get right. Yeah, that's really interesting. And I'm, yeah, it was great to hear about the importance of management groups and some of those different unique cases as well, which I'm sure would be very confusing for a lot of people, whether they've dealt with it before or just want some clarification on what to do about that. So they're submitting the data correctly. As you said, they're the eyes on the ground. Great to hear that you guys are always happy to field those questions, no matter how many you might get in a day or anything like that. Um, it's great to hear that that line of communication is always open and it's yeah nice to hear that that support is there. Also goes back to the integral role of extension within ABRI too. So I guess like the next question that I did have for you, which I'm sure is going to be of interest to a lot of people. So what are your tips and tricks for people headed off to the sales to buy a new bull? Yeah, great question. I would really recommend that people heading off to the sale do their homework. You don't want to turn up at the sale not knowing which bulls are of interest. So we we hear commonly, incorrectly, that you know breed plan only cares about the the breed plan figures, but that's not true. We understand that breed plan figures are a, a tool to be used in animal selection. But things like structural soundness, fertility, so BBSEs, bull check results are also really, really important. And to me, it's about finding a bull that meets all of the criteria. So we actually have a a breed plan guide to animal selection. And so what we recommend uh, producers do when they're heading off for any animal selection, not just when they're heading off to the sales, is... If your breed's got a selection index, which is really an EBV for profit, to find the selection index that most aligns with your production system, use that to do an initial sort of the animals that have been offered for sale. But then I would think about within the individual EBVs, what's important for your breeding objectives, for your property? Do you want more growth? Are you chasing MSA markets and want some more marbling? Do you need more muscling in your animals? Do you need to work on your calving ease in your, your female herd? Those sorts of things. And so from there, there would be a range of individual EBVs that I would say most producers would, would have have a handful of those that they are putting particular emphasis on. And so Yes, you do your initial sort on selection index, but then you go back and you look at that initial sort list and say, here's my individual EBVs that are important, which bulls fall within the criteria that I'm I'm happy with for, for each of those individual EBVs to shortlist the bulls down even further. And so I think if you do that pre-sale, that means that you're going to the sale with the opportunity to say these animals suit me from a genetic perspective and then when you get there on the day you can do things like your structural assessment of the bulls that are on your short list if your your seed stock producer has bull check results you can check check those to make sure that you're happy with with the bull you're purchasing and so I think that's a good approach because every bull on your short list should suit your production system from a genetics perspective and I, it doesn't really matter which way around you do it, whether or not you do structure, then EBVs or EBVs, then structure. We just recommend EBVs first because you can do that search and sort for a lot of breed societies have their, their database online where you can search individual EBVs, individual selection indexes for a sale catalogue. And that can really help you do that quickly. When we go and do bull select workshops with commercial producers, it is amazing how many people say to me, oh, yeah, I'm still going through the the printed catalogue and just checking them one by one. I would encourage people to jump onto their Breed Society website, 
go into the EBV inquiry page and use the online search and sort because it will do it for you quickly without you having to spend ages going through the printed catalogue. And then, as I said, you've got your bull list ready to go and you can go and do all that other important stuff on sale day like structural assessment. Those are some great tips there, Katrina. And I think it was interesting that you mentioned the search and sort tool, which I'm sure is going to save people a whole lot of time. If you've just mentioned that, people still go through the catalogue and it takes them a lot longer. So essentially saving time and being a little bit more efficient. And it's great to hear that you guys recommend like a holistic approach as well as genetics and structure. I think that's a that's a great message as well. I guess in most of my episodes, I do tend to end the the podcast with a bit of a future seeing question. So I'm curious to see what do you think are the most like exciting developments that you see coming up for the use of EBVs in the future, whether it's near future, next 10 years, long term, short term. I'm interested to hear what you see. I guess we didn't talk about it at all, but one of the things that we've seen in the last few years is the introduction of single step breed plan where we use DNA information alongside performance and pedigree information to calculate the EBVs for animals. So I think that's something that we've we've rolled out since 2017 was when our first single step analysis was released and it's been really exciting in the last 12 months to see some of our so we started with the larger breed societies just because we need numbers of animals with phenotypes or performance data as well as DNA information. And obviously larger societies, it's easier to get that critical mass. But what's been really exciting is in the last sort of 12 months, we've really seen some of our more medium-sized breed societies come on board and also some of our international clients come on board with single-step breed plan releases. So I think that's exciting because we've got work going on to deliver that to to additional clients and I think that's that's an exciting space to see developing and then yeah those those new traits enhancements to existing traits the use of uh, the development of additional additional EBVs to assist beef producers because really that's what it's all about no those sound like some exciting developments and I think it's going to be a great space to watch and I'm sure there's going to be plenty of new tools for producers to use and I'm sure that's going to bring a lot more questions for you guys too which will definitely keep you busy. So thank you so much Katrina today for sitting down and having a chat with me. It was great and very insightful. We covered off on a lot of topics which I'm sure would be of a lot of interest to a lot of different producers in New South Wales, around the country, in international markets like you said. So thank you so much for your time today. I really appreciate it. No worries. Thanks very much. Thank you. And that brings us to the end of this episode of Genetics in the Paddock with Emily. I hope you found our discussion as enlightening as I did. This episode was produced by the extensive livestock genetics team within the New South Wales government. If you enjoyed this episode, please consider subscribing to our podcast on your favourite platform, leaving us a review and sharing it with your friends and colleagues. Your feedback and support help us grow and reach more people who are passionate about livestock genetics. If you have any questions, comments or suggestions for future topics or people you'd like to hear on the show, please feel free to reach out to me on emily.johnston at dpi.newsouthwales.gov.au. Thanks again for listening and until next time. Mm